So yes, thank you everybody for coming to the Nation State Actor 8 My Homework. I'll explain the, uh, the title in a, in a sec. Quickly, a little bit about me. Began in the Cape Town InfoSec community, going to things like Xerox Coffee, B-Sides Cape Town, uh, you know, things like that. Met the right people and yeah, ended up doing the evil MSC at Rhodes. Uh, Snowflake, it's because we were called the Snowflake class, probably maybe the anti-Snowflake class. Uh, InfoSec is my day job, at Pro work at Prodigy Finance. Yes, we're hiring. If anybody wants to be an AppSec engineer, we definitely need one of those. And we, obviously, we, everybody needs developers all the time. So uh, I take it you guys like questions. So I'm going to try and fly through this because there's a lot of stuff to go through and then run out of question time. So um, what is the research about? Uh, I'd say it's, well, first of all, so looked at a whole bunch of nation state documentation, source code, and the techniques and the tools that they were you know, described in there and the actual tools that were released. This is coming from things like the shadow brokers who dumped stuff, uh, WikiLeaks. Yay, thank you, WikiLeaks, for uh, you know, making things available to us. Also Snowden. So lots and lots of information. Uh, it's a bit biased towards the Americans because, well, it's their information that got leaked. Uh, you can only see and observe certain other things. Uh, anyway, the idea was to find interesting things within that uh, large body of information, or maybe bodies of information, and then look for multiple occurrences of those interesting things to see that, okay, this, this tool was used and this other tool was used and, you know, they, they're similar, so you can maybe class them together and you can start to pick out the patterns. And by looking at the patterns, we can understand what's enabling the attack, and, like what makes it possible. And from there, you can start to do more useful things like defend against it. So uh, the process, uh, just to give you an idea, when you're dealing with large, large amounts of data, then you really want to be using things like grep because you can't read it all. You want to use find, and then if you've got PDFs, you're running PDF grep, and you, you're basically just searching through lots and lots of data. And maybe you search, first thing you search for is top secret. And after that, maybe you search for secret, and so on you go. And then you find the little interesting bits, and you find the you know, confidential and you know, five eyes only, and so on you go. So start by surveying all the sources, identifying useful files. Uh, then you would evaluate each file. Uh, if you find the best version of file, because basically some of their wikis got dumped, so you'd find multiple versions of these files. Some of them are out of date. Sometimes there's interesting things in the older versions. And you, know, you go through, they find the best versions. And if you select them for uh, further analysis, then you kind of go like this is the pile I'm going to go look at in detail later. Um, the other thing is sometimes the data, we're not just talking about text files, we're also talking about binaries and the binaries could also be just things like PDFs. I mean yes we can use PDF grep for some of those but it's also interesting to look at the metadata. So we did a bit of metadata analysis um, using commands like XF tool which I really like. It was very easy and because it's command line and you can script it you can batch run it and say find all these files, throw them to XF data so XF tool and then pull out the data that way. Uh, if you have some binaries, you can pull them apart, reverse them with something like Radar2. It's actually a suite of commands and you can literally put in a debugger and have a look and see what they're doing inside there. So basically, you know, if it's a binary, disassemble it. If it's metadata, look at it. Um, obviously, don't disassemble every binary. In fact, only a very small number of them because it takes a long, long time to uh, do that. That's a lot more manual. Um, so the overall process was analyze the content and you know, collect these things. If you've seen it before, you kind of just increment the count because there were so many of these things. You, when you're trying to say, this is the category that we've got, or the collection of things. This technique has been used. Oh, like we found the same technique again. Then you're just incrementing it. So we're literally just uh, counting at this point. Obviously, if we can't find another example, we've kind of got these are all the examples, then we start analyzing them and describing the findings. Um, so the key areas that we can talk about, we can talk a little bit about zero days, uh, power and resource imbalances, the lone wolf attacker, which is I think one of the reasons why this is relevant. It's not just the nation state actor who can do these things. Uh, hacking all the things, like literally. And inherent exploitability, exploitability, one of my big favorite topics is that one there. Uh, misattribution, because people think you can do attribution. And well, you can, but whether you can be right is a very different question. And some attacker pain points. The reason attacker pain points is, well, if we know what they don't like, then maybe we should do more of that because it seems to be working. So the original focus so of, of the research, uh, talk about this quickly, it's often not the final result. You start looking for something, but you either don't find what you're looking for. So what do you do? You can't just, oh, well, I'm going to keep looking for the thing I can't find or it's not there. 
so you don't do that. But what also can happen is you can find other things that you were not looking for, but they're very interesting. So then the focus changes, and this is very like typical of academic research. So where did it start? So why nation state actors? So after a hack, somebody blames nation state actors. They're like, well, there's nothing we could have done. I mean, come on, you know, it's a government. It's the Koreans, it's the Americans, it's the Russians, it's whoever. Like, you know, like, what are we supposed to do? Uh, so I don't like that excuse. Uh, I'm not saying that you can always stop things, but uh, you know, you can at least try. Um, they do have a lot of resources. They also do have zero days. So uh, that makes it quite interesting. Uh, the reason it was relevant, individuals have done things like hacking hard drive firmware. Uh, the guy's name, uh, surname is Van, I think it's Kai Van. He's given a talk on that and shown how to do it. So like if an individual can do it, well, it's not just a nation state actor. So uh, if you look at the NSA with all their tools, the ANT catalog has literally been re-implemented. It's now called the NSA playset and people are ta giving talks about this at DEF CON and Black Hat and whatever. So I think the, the point to take away from that is just because the nation state actors were doing it doesn't mean they're the only ones who can do it. So even if you say like, hey, nation state actors out of bounds, out of scope, I'm not protecting against that. Well, individuals are doing these things. So perhaps we should care. And then why zero days? Uh, well, because defending against a known attack is actually quite simple. Like, you know, there's a bug in your piece of software. Like, yeah, and if somebody exploits it, then they're going to get in. Like, well, patch it. But you've got a configuration issue, like, well, well, then fix the configuration. But what about unknown attacks? And that's, to me, a lot more uh, interesting. And the reasons why, uh, well, we'll talk about that in a sec. And basically, there's always something new coming along. So even if we discover everything, we patch everything, and we've configured everything right, great. Now what? Like, well, it just takes a bit more looking, and somebody's going to find some sort of bug in it. And now, OK, great, so there's going to be another bug let alone the new version of the software you're going to get, which is going to come with all new bugs as well to replace the old ones that they fixed, which is, if anyone's done software dev, you know what I'm talking about. Um, the analogy I like to use is it's playing chess, but you can't see all the pieces. Um, the, the rules are not set, so they change. You can do different moves. Uh, the pieces change, and hopefully at least the laws of physics apply and keep that constant. So the problem context is technology is flawed. So either the design is wrong, and it doesn't account for something, doesn't protect against something, or the implementation's flawed. So for example, if we assume that we have perfect cryptography, and it's just, you cannot break it. You have to either brute force it, but we have the famous implementation error, and great, you can grab the keys out of memory. Well, okay, now there's a problem, because now you don't need to break the encryption, you just use the keys, you grab the keys. Uh, human ingenuity, so novel attacks. So people are always thinking about things, poking at them from different ways, and figuring out new ways to do things. And this includes the nation state actors, but obviously it's not just them. Um, so if you have a design and you're catering for a certain uh, tax scenarios, you've got your threat model, and you've got this is what you're catering for, and then somebody else thinks of something that you've never thought about, the odds of that you've protected against that start to go down, unless you get really lucky. And luck doesn't really hold. Um, so a bit more about the problem context, processes, I mean, you can have simply deficient processes or you can have good processes which are not adhered to. Uh, got, really got a good example, a uh, parcel was supposed to come to me and it needed to be redirected and I had to start filling in forms and I was sending off IDs and things like that. And I was literally just told that when the gentleman who was going to the airport was where they got the parcels coming in from internationally, that they asked him for the forms after they handed him the parcel, and then they let him email it to them on his way out. So then it was kind of like, well, why did I fill in all these forms? You know, like, what's the point? Anybody could have gone there, asked for the parcel, got it, like, sure, I'll email you. <laughs> Good luck with that. Uh, people are vulnerable to exploitation. I'm not particularly talking about intimidation here or things like that, but a lack of critical thinking. So if you think about phishing, uh, you get this email, and the email says, hey, we're doing a server upgrade. And if you don't uh, confirm your banker details, the bank is going to remove your account. Like, like, no, 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 the bank is not going to do that. Even if you don't understand what an upgrade is, what a server is, you are a client of the, of the bank, but you also how they make money. If the bank was going to remove your account, the bank would make less money. The bank's not going to remove your account because they want to make money. That's why they exist. And at the same time, you know, the only, like, they will shut down your account if there's major pressure from, for example, the government or there's some regulatory problem because otherwise they lose their banking license or something, then they really lose money. So, you know, people should think a little bit more. Uh, critical thinking is an underrated skill. Uh, also, lack of knowledge, understanding. 
if you don't understand how something works, then it's easy to be bamboozled and conned into it. Anyway, now we start getting to more of the, uh, the fun stuff. So some of the results that came out of the research, there were various attacker techniques. I've selected some of them because literally there's like hundreds of pages of stuff going on here. Uh, some defender tactics, I think, which are useful against these techniques of the attackers. Uh, some lessons that were learned and some interesting observations because quite a few of those were interesting. So attacker techniques, starting with Tempest. Um, the reason, uh, I don't, does anybody know what Tempest is? But basically it's about electromagnetic uh, radiation. So if you've got a computer, it's actually sending out EFI and electromagnetic radiation, which is a signal, which is you know, a wave, and you can pick it up with an antenna. And this goes way back, things like World War I with trench warfare and running a cable. But they'd literally run one strand and they'd use the, uh, the earth or the ground as the return path. So the other side figures this out and starts putting like, poles into the ground and connecting up wires and tapping the signal. So th that's why you now have two strands, at least in the later versions of uh, the cables that were being run. Shame, poor guy's got a heavier backpack now. Um, if you look at operating system functionality, it exists. So attackers have been moving more and more towards uh, reusing the operating system functionality. I mean, why go and re-implement that which is already there? It just makes your binary size bigger. Uh, it takes more time. Um, so, you know, more complicated. It might not work. So if you want to delete a file, just ask the OS to delete it for you. Uh, if you want to read a file, you know, you don't have to go and write your own uh, piece of software to do that. Uh, Anti-forensics, uh, it's a big thing. If you go, if you go through this, there's some very interesting guides on it. And they literally have development techniques to avoid attribution. So, you know, remove the timestamps. You know, they say, like, don't set it to US time and, you know, don't leave the compiler flags in there and, you know, strip out the debugging symbols. And it's just, it goes on and on and on. Uh, very interesting if you ever want to see what other people are doing. Don't, don't do things like this. Uh, they do hardware exploits as well, uh, firmware, which we'll go talk about now. So, this is going deeper to avoid security. It's a bit of a recurring theme that was observed. So if you have an application and there's a problem in it and the attacker gets in and they break it, well, okay, cool. What about the operating system? The operating system can see what's happening to the application there. It can say, like, hey, like, you know, it's throwing errors. Like, so you've got log files and the log files could be going somewhere. You could be looking at them. So there's a problem, which is why after you get into the application as an attacker, you'd probably want to go down and get control of the operating system and you know, delete those log files clear your traces. The same thing with the hypervisor, it's sitting below the operating system. As far as the operating system is concerned, it doesn't know what it thinks it's talking to some hardware. And you can sit down, you go, the CPU has got the protected mode. So the hypervisor doesn't, doesn't know about that. Then you have a service processor below that. And yes, if you're a big go government customer and certain large corporates, etc., they actually manage to get their laptops uh, without a service proce processor installed. Clearly, some people think it's a really bad idea. It has direct access to the memory, you know, like that's, that's useful functionality to have. Also has direct access to your network card and can use that without you knowing about it. And obviously the operating system can't see this. So like how does your malware detect about that? So the, one of the key takeaways from the talk is can you defend against something you can't see? It's, it's beyond the scope of what you control or is what's visible to you. So if you can only see the OS, now what? So. If you look at what the attackers are doing, so uh, they're examining malware to learn new techniques. Uh, as I recall, I think the CIA was outsourcing it to, was it Rayathon? Literally, like another company was going through malware that was coming out, new malware, and saying, hey, here's a new technique, and like, hey, we haven't seen this before, and, and they'd incorporate it into their, uh, well, to their software. Uh, they would also do a lot of testing against security products, and not just uh, like McAfee versus Kaspersky versus Norton or whatever it is, but McAfee, McAfee Standard Edition, Enterprise Edition, etc. Uh, McAfee or Kaspersky with an internet connection, without an internet connection, because the antivirus software behaves differently, or the anti-malware software. Uh, so they, they keep testing until it goes through, uh, as in undetected. So it does give you pause for thought about how good is the software you've got and what's it going to pick up. Um, some of the defender tactics is uh, learning from attackers. So if we look at what they're doing, what, what is their behavior? They're sitting there and they're looking and they, they're looking for vulnerabilities. They're fuzzing or they're looking for bad code and they're trying to find these. Uh, so we have probably two options. One is we could fix them. The second one is we can monitor them. So 
I wouldn't really advise not fixing them and only monitoring them in your production. But if you have a dev environment or you have a, a honeypot environment, then perhaps not fixing them and just monitoring them might be very interesting. If anybody's ever poking at that hole, then be very, I'd, I'd take that as a serious sign that uh, I've got problems coming. The other thing is attackers respect this. And if you look through their documentation, you'll literally find warnings. Like, if you see database order, auditing, stop now and go and like, get the guy who really knows what's going on here. Uh, same with, uh, if you see remote syslog, do not hack this firewall. Do not run this like zero-day exploit against this device, whether it's a, I think it was a Cisco ASA or might have been a Juniper. But anyway, they're talking about remote syslog. So they're really, really cautious of that. And they say things, or they write things along the lines of, if you see this, do not go forward until you've at least disabled remote syslog or you've control, you have gained control of the remote syslog service that you can raise your tracks. Uh, core dumps is a similar one. They're talking about if you're attacking an application, for example, I think it was Solaris, when you cause the application to crash, then it's going to, by default, it writes out a core dump file with the memory. Now, if you have your, your executable or your uh, attack code, I should say your shell code, it's going to get dumped into the memory, like for that application, which is then going to be dumped on file. So they talk about running it again without a payload in order to overwrite the dump file to make sure, sorry, the, well, the core file, the core dump, to make sure that somebody can't go and reverse it and grab hold of your nice exploit code. Now, there's some interesting things we can do about this. Like if we know that, we can say like, oh, I'll well, set that there's a timestamp or something like, you know, makes it unique so that every time it writes out a core dump file, you get a, a different core dump file. So they can sit there and they can rewrite it. And I mean, by the time you get like 100 of them, it could be quite a, quite a good tell. Go look at the first one. Uh, you could also do a few things like, you know, export them to a remote system, maybe a remote file system. Make sure they get copied somewhere where it's, you know, another system that's really locked down. Um, but the thing to ask yourself is also why. Why do they respect these things like tripwire? Uh, and you probably everybody knows what tripwire is, but you basically foot, oh, sorry, ah. You uh, baseline the file system and you fingerprint it, and if somebody starts changing it, then you know you've got a problem. Somebody's got in there and they're making changes. Why do they care? Well, they don't want to be detected. They want to maintain covertness. Uh, one of the reasons why uh, probably people don't realize they've been breached for so long is because people are trying to keep a low profile. Um, but what does this mean for defenders? Firstly, uh, we should use these and similar techniques, like these ones, <laughs> the ones that they don't like. Um, we should also understand what's happening here. Effectively, like the same problem where you can't observe things and you can't protect against them because it's happening below or beneath or outside of your scope that you control, here we're effectively externalizing the defenses. So we're going out and out and out. So for example, let's say the system is completely compromised and they're into the firmware and they've put stuff in the hard, uh, sorry, into the hard drive firmware and you can't see it. And now they've got persistence and they're doing all these great things or terrible things depending on which side you want to look at it then we, how are you going to pick this up? And one thing that they probably want to do is still to exfiltrate the data. So if you, if you control the network and you can at least monitor the network traffic, you should maybe find it going to unusual IP addresses or at unusual times. So you can look for things like time, location, uh, the type of traffic. I mean, the one thing to do though is for the attackers, I suppose, to hide in plain sight or do the stenography route and you know, they, they're just going to they should know where your traffic is going and then put something there and kind of like try and hide amongst the, the herd of data going off to wherever it is, whether it's Google Drive or Facebook or whatever your employees are doing all day. So another thing we came out is uh, lower barriers to entry for attackers. So the cost of technology continues to drop. Uh, if you look at some of the things that the attackers were doing, like very, very expensive like 175,000 US dollars, 250,000 dollars, but they're imitating a, a base station. But some of the things are very cheap, these little retro reflectors. And with the cost of hardware, uh, if you look at the electronic badges, as I recall, the, the cost was less, was about 400 Rand, I think, a pop to, in terms of components. And there's quite a lot of stuff going on in there. Uh, if you think about Raspberry Pi, how that's brought down the cost of things, Arduino, all these hackers, like this is well within the scope and the means of, I think, the average person who was, owns a soldering iron and you know, has got a computer. And that's probably about it. If you own those two things, you can definitely afford the next bits. Uh, anybody got the electronic badges? That's got an ESP8266 in it, and you might want to have a closer look at that. Um, code and hardware use, they're literally making these things modular. So one of the problems with if you're writing software and it gets detected by one of the, the vendors, 
Kaspersky or whoever, Norton, then they flag this thing. And then if it gets used again, well, it's going to show up and the alarm bell is going to go off because, hey, it's already been identified as a problem. So you make it portable uh, or maybe you should say plug and play. You t take the little bits and pieces out of it. So you have the first thing to get your initial foothold, like the actual thing that like the zero day or maybe the non-zero day if you're targeting somebody with really old software. Windows XP, you don't need zero days. Who's patching that? But in you get, but you can also have different payloads. So if your payload gets found, the payload to, I don't know, uh, collect all the data or to scan the network, if that gets identified, you can swap it out with another one. And now instead of having to build a whole new piece of software from scratch, then take the old one out, put the new one in, and off you go. And same thing with like maybe the way it deletes itself or the way it's covered its, covered its tracks. So yeah, modularity. Uh, the hardware reuse, uh, for example, just being able to exfiltrate data, the Bluetooth module versus a, a Wi-Fi, 2G, 3G on the cellular side, and so on. M another fun thing, I found a lot of portable apps. They had a long list of them that were, they were using DLL hijacking. So I started to ask myself, look, well, why is this the case? Like, why, when an app is portable, does it suffer so much from this problem? And I think you know, anybody familiar with DLLs, this is like a search path and it goes and like looks at the first location, the second location to find the DLL and eventually, oh, it's found it. But when you take the application and you port it to a USB, like how many developers actually go and remove all those search paths? So they're still there. So, you know, knowing that, you just put the DLL where it's going to find it before it looks on the USB drive. And yeah, easy way to get it to load your code. Uh, some lessons learned. Air gaps have been dead for a long time. Basically, it just means they've been compromised. Um, and there's even examples from universities. Uh, I think it's been Garion University in, in Israel. They got loads and loads of examples of these things. They literally take a USB device and start making it work like a radio, like numbers of reads and writes, and it creates a little signal, and you get a little wave, and then like you can put information out over that, and then you can listen for that and grab it. So the advice was always been like you so not, has not always been. The advice which governments keep under wraps is basically keep red and black zones. So you're basically just increasing the distance because you know, the, the power falls off what's to the inverse of the square of the distance is the power that you've got. So if you start putting a bigger distance, like you have this room versus that room over there, you, it's much better. If you have like the computer versus the computer and they're both plugged into the same wall sockets, there's a nice copper connector. You can start pulling things out of the power supplies and things like that. Uh, very difficult to do these things, but it's definitely possible. And like literally, you can go and check the demos out. Uh, another thing is the attack surface varies on access. So if we have a system on the internet, that's one set of access. If you have the same system on an internal network, it's a different level of access. I mean, your threat model should be changing dramatically. If you have the same system and it's not connected to a network, it's like much harder to get onto this machine now because it's not on any network. And you know, if this machine was sitting just next to a machine and all it did was run that machine, you know. That, that does help, although we all know about Stuxnet and things like that, where you know, sneak a net with a USB and it's like, well, good way to get around that. But a much, uh, much greater level of, how do you want to say it, uh, resources were required, time, risk in terms of being discovered. Uh, another thing, for example, uh, apps trust, well, this is actually, in this case, a database is the app. It trusts the OS, back to that, uh, the layers below that you trust. So you add your user to the SysDBA group, and as far as Oracle's concerned, hey, you're, uh, you're, like, you're the dude, right? You're, you're the systems administrator for the database. More lessons are learned. Uh, I like this one a lot. Uh, security principles are often ignored, especially if you're Intel and you're trying to like, really make fast processes. So you're going huge into speculative execution. I'm pretty sure we all know about Meltdown and Spectre now. But the thing is, they're ignoring what they should be doing. So they're accessing memory they don't have access to, but it's only speculatively, and we'll throw away the result when we find out that it's wrong. Yes, but it's already in the cache because you've done a fetch for memory, which is what the cache is used for. And then thinking about this, you get to the interesting point of like, well, you get information leakage via energy for a side channel, but you can also get information leakage, which is deducible from other read readable information. For example, the cache. Like, oh, it's fast, it must be in the cache. Okay, I guess we got that piece of information. Like, and if you say, like, is it these eight bits or was it these eight bits? And then you find out which one's quick and then like, okay, I guess we figured out those eight bits. Uh, you can also look at faults though. So for example, I mean the famous one, well, I can imagine say the famous one, but like the, the login thing, we don't say, hey, you got your password right. Good username, bad password, because then you're allowing for enumeration of the, the username. But what happens if you've got a, an error message saying like, whoa, hang on, exception. 
and like you're giving all the data, like here's the API or, you know, that you're talking to, and here's the token we use, et cetera, et cetera. And oh, the fault was the other side wasn't responding. I'm like, great, so I'll just try again, and we'll, we'll see. So not just for crypto analysis. I think uh, anybody's looked into that. It's like famous, you're looking for an oracle. Because you can't get it at directly, you look from the side, and you poke at something, and you're either doing power analysis or timing analysis or size analysis uh, if you have compression. Um, some very interesting observations that were found. Uh, sanitizing a Git repo is really hard. Uh, WikiLeaks in general does a very, very good job of sanitizing information. You find like a PDF and it's been stripped. There's no meta information at all. Uh, you go find the same PDF because it's, it's just a PDF that somebody's downloaded from whatever, uh, like Kaspersky has got some research and I think, the, I think that was one of the examples. I found it on the, the original and they were just talking about grayfish and all these, uh, well, some of the stuff they'd found. And then you look at the exact same version. It's the same file, just had the meta information removed. So they were quite good at scrubbing it. But as we all know, you know any developers checking binaries into Git is bad. Because you check in a PDF and, well, WikiLeaks didn't go and find the people's names in that one. So it's interesting to see, read these people's names. Um, so OPSEC is important because they were literally using their real names. I mean, you work for the CIA or the NSA and you're like, you sign with your real name, and you're on the wiki with your real name. And like, yes, WikiLeaks went and scrubbed the stuff really well. But if you look at the, using the right commands, you go look through a Git repo, even though they've scrubbed most of the, uh, the commits, well, all the commits, I should say, and they've removed the people's names, you can actually go find these people. And like, I'm not mentioning their names, but it's interesting when you go look up their names, you go like, oh, guy says he used to work for the CIA. You're like, yeah, this looks pretty legit then. You know, I don't think this has been falsified, this information. Because, like, yeah, that'd be quite tricky to know that somebody's going to make a mistake in Git, and then somebody else is going to miss it, and, 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 and somebody else is going to go look there. It's like, very, uh, very interesting was the industrialized malware production. This has been done on a vast scale. So they have test beds set up and they're testing this stuff. Uh, they're using Agile, they're having retros, they're having stand-up, uh, they're using source code management, wikis. Uh, I think it looked, all looked like Confluence and that's how I think somebody got hold of a backup if I had to take a guess of how that got dumped and turned into a, a WikiLeaks leak. Then we have uh, misattribution. Uh, she's a harsh, mi harsh mistress. Um, avoiding attribution. So the first thing you can do is you can scrub uh, the artifacts out. And literally, you know, the compiler flags, you can change the variables. And again, like these organizations have long lists of, well, they're not that long. They've got good advice on their wikis of how to avoid leaving anything behind that's going to be used to, you know, point you out. Like, uh, like what's the keyboard settings? Like what's the time zone? What's the locale? And like, just they just scrub all that stuff out. But a far more interesting thing to do is like, well, you know people are going to be looking. They're going to reverse engineer this. They're going to do some forensic analysis on this. Like they found this piece of malware and it's caused havoc on their system. It's well, it cost them millions or they've called the right people in and it's been found. Why don't we just give them something to find? And so we put a few artifacts in place and some really great examples of Marble and Farble. And they're literally mangling, uh, well, I shouldn't say mangling, they're encoding and decoding effectively. So it's still, the program still works. They're swapping out characters, Unicode characters specifically, into things like variable names. So anybody looks at it will then find things like, you know, oh, here's some Arabic at the top, or you've got, you can choose Chinese or Russian or Korean or Farsi, which is very, very similar to Arabic. But it really makes people think like, well, I mean, come on, who in the, who's, who's using, uh, you know, Russian? I mean, it's got to be the Russians, right? Like, I mean, come on. Or not, as the case may be. The other thing you can do is attack via a third party. So this was just a list of the domains that were of systems that were compromised for pitch and pair and intonation, uh, which are two uh, basically, I suppose, exploits slash implants, which is the word they like to use for uh, Solaris machines. Actually, it covered Solaris, Linux, and a bunch of different operating systems, but more the Unix ones, the ones typically used for web servers. And a lot of these were in universities, if you look up the domains or the IP addresses. And again, we can see that, you know, it's like Japan, Korea, there's quite a nice big, big number there. Next to Russia, there's a decent number. And, you know, on you go, India, etc. And, you know, China there, really big number. Well, one, these are actually all large countries in terms of population size, number of computers, number of universities. So it really stands to reason. But, and this stuff does get used later, which is great fun. Um, the one thing I was talking about, though, is you know, people are trying to be covert, and that is why they're worried about being discovered in a remote syslog. You know, China is kind of taking a different stance on this. They're like, hey, great wall of, great firewall of China. 
So you can basically only use their local services. Um, well, not only, but trust me, it's much easier to use uh, WeChat there than it is to use uh, WhatsApp. Uh, encryption is also blocked at the VPN level. Uh, to register that VPN, you have to be a Chinese company in China, China and you're probably going to be handing over the keys. So it's very overt. Like we all know the Chinese are looking. The Chinese know that we know. Like we know that they know. And, you know, like it's kind of it's a bit silly, but you know they're not going to be worried about being found out that they're looking. Like we all know this already, so that changes the calculus there a bit. The uh, a bit of anatomy of a hack. So actual hack. We've all heard of the the Swift. Well, I'm pretty sure the Swift network, the one in uh, well Eastnet, is the one. The CEO was very adamant they had not been breached. Like, no, dude, no, you definitely, definitely were breached. Um, <laughs> nice little bit of a timeline. You can see starting in 2012, going through you know, quite a bit later into 2013, so more than a year, which is why I said about it. if you don't know that you've been breached, you can't do anything about it. Um, there's some really good write-ups on this. Uh, I haven't seen a timeline like this. Uh, I suspect some of these are slightly wrong in terms of the dates, just because the Yanks have a very special way of dealing with dates, and sometimes they're day and month are swapped around and sometimes they're not. So it depends on who's writing it, I suppose. Um, so the first time they actually got in with uh, zero day using Blyer and uh, yeah, the, they literally broke into the firewall. So the nice, uh, I think it was a Juniper. Doesn't really matter though. They had a whole long suite of these things for different uh, vendors. And yeah, popped onto the firewall and the th second thing they did in that uh, instance was they installed an implement, implant onto a Windows server. And basically, that was going to be their foothold now with a callback or you know, the network's going out again to respond to connections. So the second time, so this is like a few days later or a month later or whatever, they just connect to the Windows server. You don't go and reuse the zero day. You don't have to break the firewall again. You've already got your foothold. And now you do a network scan. So they're starting to enumerate. And anybody who's done a bit of pen testing, you're starting to prepare for lateral movement, right? Enumerate and spread. Um, so third time, connected to a Windows server, and now they're looking for the Oracle databases, so we could see what they're finding. They try to get into the database and collect information out of it. Uh, their survey failed. So it's great fun reading their, their notes, and then the notes are saying, like, uh, you know, I think they use the word dorked a lot. Um, anyway, and then, like, you know, they bugged out. Uh, fourth time, they connected to the Windows server, and this time they successfully su surveyed the Oracle database. And by surveyed, I mean they grabbed the data out of it that they wanted to, and they copy this to local files, and they upload these files. And they used nice... Uh, random names that look very much like Windows, I think it's temp file names. So you won't find uh, funny file names and then delete them. Cover your tracks, right? Um, they actually even ran a quantum campaign. I think anybody look up very interesting stuff, quantum. Uh, it's like man on the side, not quite man in the middle, but very similar concept uh, against the employees. So they were trying to gather information. They were connected to the Windows server, of course, because that's how they started, and all, scanned the network. This time they were looking at the uh, more the, the workstations of the people, and they were looking for specific individuals, like by name, um, trying to find, uh, I think they had their credentials, and I think they were trying to use those credentials on the inside now. Um, sixth time, the four different Windows servers, and they were doing maintenance, because you've got to patch the software, even if you're the attack, apparently. It's quite, quite fun. Some things we can take away from this, though, are, so they used varying compromised jump servers. So I, I didn't include them in, in these slides, but every time that they did one of those intrusions, they came from a different part of the world, back to that other slide I was showing you. Um, they used a lot of scripted automated tools. They weren't going in there and figuring it out, like they're on the fly, oh, how do I write an SQL query to survey this database? They had them. I mean, the first one didn't work. They just bugged out, went and tried again, and put it together. Uh, again, I mentioned it lasted more than a year. So it's not just, uh, was it certain, was it? Who was that again? Target, I think, who didn't realize for quite a while. So apparently the Swift network, so everybody who does banking, awesome. Uh, well documented, the network diagrams, I think a network engineer would have been proud of them. They had like little, you know, bubbles for the internet and how different offices, how they tied together with the VPNs, the local networks. They had dumped the contents of DNS. They had like lists and spreadsheets and they had credentials, uh, they, had con they had dumped the configs of the routers, they dumped the configs of the VPN devices. They literally had, they had everything really. So when the, that dude who's the CEO says that they were not compromised, like no, 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 you definitely were. Hack all the things. If you go look there, you'll find they've got scripts on grabbing the, the password database or attempting to grab the database from Mikrotik routers, uh, Apple Airport time capsule. I of, I've used to have fights with people about Apple being secure. Like, yeah, it might be more secure, but it's not secure, secure. It's like, 
You know, it's like if you've got one window in your house that they can break into versus, you know, five, like they're still going to be in your house. Um, they pull apart the firmware. So they buy these things, they pull them apart. Hydra is now open source. Time it wasn't. Uh, Binwalk, they literally go through the, the firmware. And the firmware tends to be packaged and packaged and packaged. And by what mean that they pull out one chunk of the firmware and it, then that, that's another archive and they extract that. And they're literally looking for things like the keys in there used for encryption. Because why try and break encryption where you can just get the keys? Uh, also break software, create hardware implants, and firmware as well, which is not on the slide. So one of the, the things I'd like to touch on quickly is inherent exploitability. If you think about phones, uh, they broadcast, they're looking for the, the network, saying, hey, I'm here, are there any base stations? Can I connect? Um, very, it's the way it's been designed. So back to that design principle at the beginning. So it's, e it's possible to set up a listening post or a, a you know, tripwire to say, like, hey, if this phone that I'm looking for comes into distance, and you, you know, if, you, if you're the NSA or the CIA or whoever, and you're looking for somebody, the GRU, I think, blame the Russians, then when that phone gets into, to, uh, well, I suppose distance, or close enough to be you know, identified, then you can say like, oh, well now we know this person's rocked up. So, uh, you know, if you're going to do crime, you probably don't want to be carrying these things is the takeaway from that. Uh, DNS is public. It's meant to be read. It's not the only source. But if you have DNS records, you put them in there. You want people to query them. So the attacker is going to query them. It's going to make their lives easier. Oh, let me just dump the DNS. Now I know what you have. It's a nice set of here's all the systems to go and have a look at. Uh, so that's why attackers can use it to enumerate. Uh, the fun thing about these things is like they're a double-edged sword or you know, it's two sides of the coin. So you can modify the design. Okay, it's very, very difficult to do that something with a cell phone network. But maybe, uh, what's it, 6G, maybe they'll, they'll fix some of these things. You can have the base stations do the announcing or the shouting, saying, hey, I'm here. Like, yeah, any phones? Like, still here. Just, just talk to me. Uh, maybe they could actually like, certify that they are who they say they are, much like a server on the internet has got a certificate saying that it is who it is and it's trusted by various paths. And maybe do not just one, maybe do multiple, like a web of trust instead of a chain of trust. Uh, you can put interesting things in DNS for attackers to find that you are monitoring for, uh, like honey tokens, effectively, and monitor for them. So kind of flipping on its on its head. Like if, if they're going to come and find things or look for things, you know, it's not just anti-forensics, misattribution, it's like the attackers, yeah, have a look. We'll be waiting for you. Uh, people, educate and upskill, uh, support them with technology and processes because you don't want them to be the only point, the single point of failure. Had a quick chat to uh, Mr. Rudman who gave talking, asking about MFA and why you know, banks don't use more of that. He says sometimes the customs are silly, they just put the stuff in anyway. Uh, some of them are quite good though, they, they're resistant to man in the middle attacks because they know where they're supposed to be used and they won't allow themselves to be used. They're not going to talk to some proxy server, they're going to be like, that's not where I'm supposed to go. Uh, processes, uh, it's just a, a maturity model. If you, first of all, you should be identifying them, uh, you should document them and define them. That these are now our processes, obviously you should implement them and you should force adherence, so you should probably be monitoring them. And they shouldn't be static, so you should... Uh, continual improvement going on there. Uh, closing thoughts. Uh, so there's always going to be bugs, or zero days, if you want, want to call them that. Uh, these will always be exploited. Uh, there's the defender's dilemma, which is the attacker only has to get it right once to get in. I think the IRA used to say that. Interestingly, there's also the uh, attacker's dilemma, which is kind of the inverse of that. It's like the attacker only has to make one mistake to be detected. So if you're looking, you've got a chance. and I would say operate accordingly. So thank you very much. Questions? Maybe about why something is the way it is or more information about something? Because I had to fly through that to get it done. Yes? No? Ah, sorry. In your research, did you, you, you touched a bit on uh, the fact that, that they're, they're doing the homework with cases showing what they shouldn't be doing, how they may be detected, etc. Do you find anything suggesting that they're actually doing any form of training to uh, underground training to groups of people to teach them how to evade these things, or is it more a case of finding documentation? Um, I didn't. I didn't find the training for groups of people like external to their organisations. They definitely had like hand holding and new developers and buddy buddy systems and things like that. So literally, I said like. But it's running like a professional organization. These people are rocking up there nine to five. And so if you think about the man, manpower that's going on there, yes, the scale is quite large and 
can get a lot of things done that way. Yep. So, do you think there's any, uh, based on, <coughs> you're talking a lot about attribution. Yep. Do you think there's any meaningful way to do attribution, or do you think it's just... Um, the closest that I've found, like my thing that I think is the most valuable, uh, something uh, Kaspersky's talked about, they're looking at the code and the way it's written. And they say, like, they're looking at the style of the code. And I think that is harder, it's harder to fudge because you actually have to write code and you write code in a certain way based on the way your mind works. So that I think is probably the closest. Anything else is much easier to fake. And it's not to say you can't imitate somebody else's coding style, but it's a lot harder. So that's the closest. Um, location, you go through a third party. Um, forensic artifacts, you can scrub them and you can insert other ones. I mean, I don't know if anybody else can think of something. Uh, they were literally uh, pulling apart the code, like reverse engineering it to actually get to the code. So I think a lot of the stuff ends up looking a, a lot more like assembly <laughs> or assembler, depending on how you want to say it. And they start picking up uh, recurring things. So a lot of it's a human. You get, they get familiar if you keep looking at the code and you start. Uh, I think the NSA came unstuck because they uh, were doing things that were interesting outside of the norm. They were using custom crypto. So like that stands out, like, well, who does this? And then they were initializing it using negative <coughs> constants instead of positive constants, which is the default. So like they really made themselves stand out and were quite unique in that way. And like nobody else is doing it. Uh, there's a few other ones. I think um, uh, sometimes the way they do, was it the, the locking mechanism? I think that, that also stood out. So unique things stand out. If you go and use open source software and you reuse that, well, now it just looks like a piece of open source software. So yeah. So I don't know if that helps yeah. on so how, how, how to spot these things. But a lot of, a lot of manual effort. Okay, thanks. Yep. Yeah, so while you were doing the research, what was the most common thing that came up that tied everything together? Um, in terms of technique or in terms of technique from the attackers? Um, yeah, I mean, to, to me, one thing, that's, one thing that really struck me is that when they doing the stuff, like actually the, the using the, the things would be start off with an initial get in, and just like a pen, penetration test. And it was like, it seemed very, very similar. It's like, I wonder if these guys were ex-pen testers or, you know, so uh, what they do and wha how, or how they approach a problem and how a pen tester approaches a problem seems to be very, very similar. Maybe bigger resources, you know, you can have custom hardware and, you know, imitate base, base stations, although nowadays you can buy those things and, just don't let the customers find them. Um, pineapples, and th et cetera, is the Wi-Fi equivalent of what they were doing. So the parallels are quite striking. Um, yeah. Yep. Do, do you do anything to mitigate hardware vendor backdoors or things like Intel management engine that might be, uh, that might be misbehaving or have vulnerabilities? So do I do anything? Yeah, do you do anything to help mitigate that? So the one thing is, talked about was the, the network monitoring. So I, I do like network monitoring and blocking things off like that, compartmentalizing things. So yes, it's compromised, but now you better get there and have your own uh, Wi-Fi signal into this thing in order to be able to get the information out of it because I'm not going to provide you the network. Or if I do, like, I'm going to be watching what you're doing. So big, big fan of monitoring, things like that. I uh, also like to upgrade firmware a lot myself. So uh, you know, you can if you think the firmware is being compromised, I would say dumping the firmware and the, like, so you can also read the firmware, dump it and then uh, check some it. So if you know that it's good, so you, there's strategies that can be in, in place. Sorry, uh, we're actually out of time. Yep. I think maybe we can, you can ask him outside. Uh, so let's cool. just thank Lion for that talk. Cool.